I made them. <laughs> I made a toe from scratch. Okay. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I created life inside of me. So there's, there's this bond that, you know, is unimaginable and indescribable. And, and, and I'm okay with that. I'm, if he's a mama's boy, I'm fine with that. Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Episode number 178. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jill Eisenstadt, IBCLC, which stands for International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, and I help moms with breastfeeding. It is my pleasure to bring you today's show with a wonderful, warm-hearted local Phoenix mom that I met about a year ago. It is not easy for us to share parts of our lives that are not perfect It is not easy to show our vulnerability to the rest of the world. My guest today does just this, even though it is somewhat embarrassing for her, both personally and professionally. I care about all of you as well as my guests. And while it was not fun for Elizabeth to share her imperfections with the rest of the world, I believe she has added so much value to her interview by bringing us into her personal life and being real with us. I have facilitated enough moms groups to know that in this sharing, this enables the next mom to tell her truth, either to others in her life or even to herself. When this happens, if there are changes to be made, it enables them to begin to make those changes. Here we go with today's show. Elizabeth Joseph is a certified holistic nutrition specialist, colon hydrotherapist, chef, author, and proud to say mommy. Elizabeth Joseph began as a self-educated and self-taught raw chef, selling her goodies and teaching small classes around the Valley of Phoenix, Arizona. As she became engulfed in the natural healing world, she attended seminars, retreats, and expos, meeting and working with some of the most famous and established doctors and raw chefs. Elizabeth Joseph started Be More Raw in late 2013, realizing her passion for health through natural modalities. In 2014, she became certified as a holistic nutrition specialist, which involves life coaching and one-on-one guidance towards attaining a better life through a whole foods diet. Her practice is unique because she utilizes her knowledge on colon health along with her nutrition expertise with her clients. As a new mother, staying healthy and living a chemical-free and organic lifestyle is now more important than ever. She has since touched countless people's lives. Her unmatched passion for health and quest for knowledge has kept her fulfilled, doing what she loves, helping others. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Lori. This is going to be great because I have, well, I know that you've helped several family members of mine. I have a personal interest in everything that you're doing. And I love the fact that you are a new mommy and I'm sure that you have learned a lot of things along the way, whatever was book learned and working with other people beforehand. Now that you're a mom gone through pregnancy, birth, and almost a full year of postpartum, I'm sure you have taught yourself even more than you knew before, just based on your own personal experience, right? Oh my God, I've learned so much. There's so much to being a mom and so many things that come up. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I've definitely learned a lot and, 
I definitely use that with my clients because now that I'm a mother and I'm breastfeeding, there's a lot of things that I can't take actually, you know, so that's been definitely challenging. You know, I, I really felt like I had health and nutrition in the bag, but it's definitely been, um, yeah, just a new challenge and definitely really educational for me to learn about, you know, what things I can and can't do and what things are okay that people may tell you aren't. Yeah, I think it's really great to learn from teachers and others, learn from our clients, and then incorporate our own personal experience into it. And then you take what you've learned, and I'm sure you're not just saying whatever you've learned with your own self and your body as a new mommy who's breastfeeding, but listening to other people too. So it's all great. And I can't wait to really get a lot of that information out to my audience. And I, I first like to just have a little bit idea about what, what it was like for you when you were growing up with regards to, did you have dreams as a, a little girl or a young woman about what you would be doing? I, I have a feeling that you weren't dreaming about becoming a personal chef. <laughs> That's totally right. I mean, I definitely had dreams. Actually, I grew up acting, modeling, and singing. So both my parents are musicians. I love all types of music. I still love to sing. Yeah, I've, I've been acting and modeling from a very young age, probably as early as like seven or eight years old. And then I think high school hit. Yeah, it just slowed way down for some reason. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I definitely wasn't thinking about nutrition when I was eating my Pop-Tarts and hot dogs. Oh, I was listening to another podcast and they were introducing John. I think his name is McKay. You might know that uh, the the gentleman who started Whole Foods and he was talking about how he grew up and the, the foods that he was eating. And he grew up probably in around the same time frame as I did. And it was so funny because my husband and I were listening to the podcast and we were like, that was us. That was us. The interviewer asked him, you know, did you grow up in a family that was eating largely fruits, veggies and whole foods? And he's like, oh, no, he's like, I grew up in an age where the the American housewife was just so thrilled that TV dinners came on the market. And so he said, so I had my Fruit Loops and Cheerios for breakfast and my Pop-Tarts. And so he went through this whole litany and Alan and I were like, us too, us too. And then he started to tell about his humble beginnings about natural foods. He wound up in a co-op uh, in, in Texas, and that was a whole new world to him, and he got turned on to it. But that's exactly it. That's how many of us, you know, our moms thought that they were doing good. Of course, of course. You just do the best you can until you know better and, and then make baby steps. Yeah, what is that saying? We do better when we know better? Yeah, exactly. So I would love for you to tell me a little bit about your life as a, a new mom. And I'm really interested to find out about breastfeeding. I want to start with that. So the first question I have for you is I'm always interested to learn how women make that decision to breastfeed. Is it something that for, for a long time they knew that when they had a baby, they would breastfeed where they kind of turned onto it when you know, sometimes when we get pregnant, we're just looking at the world through a different lens. And now we see or we're reading about breastfeeding and something we never even thought about. So I'd like to know how you made the decision. And then piggybacking with that, I'd love to know how you prepared with classes, books, videos, hanging out with friends who are breastfeeding. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I started my you know journey on this natural health path a few years back. So um, I actually didn't want kids for a really long time. And it's like, it's like they tell you like, right when I hit 30, all of a sudden I was like, I need a baby right now. <laughs> but I was already on that natural path. I, I knew that if I was ever gonna have a kid, I knew exactly what and how I wanted to do it. And uh, for me, breastfeeding was the only option. It wasn't even a decision I had to make. It was, that's, that's what you do, you know? And, and of course I completely understand that there, there are mothers out there that, that can't breastfeed. I had some of them actually, you know, in my classes and we talked about, you know, good alternatives, which we can talk about later if you'd like. Yeah. For me, it was a no brainer. I didn't prepare very much. There were a lot of books recommended for me. There's one 
Uh, I partnered with a few doctors in the Valley being a nutritionist. And one of them was like, you got to see a lactation consultant. You, you have to. And I was like, okay. And I just really trust him. He's a really great guy. Uh, his name is Dr. Ben Tati. I was like, okay. And he recommended uh, some lady, some crazy lady named Lori Eisenstadt. Oh, that's you. <laughs> we had a great consult. And afterwards, I really couldn't believe the amount of information that we went over. I, there's no way that I could have learned that amount in a book. I, I really don't see that as possible. And I've, I've recommended, I think every new mom should see a lactation consultant. I really, really do. I mean, it was a huge help. I did plan for a home birth and did end up in the hospital and there was a free lactation consultant there. But, you know, when I was, you know, it, it's different when the baby comes out, you know, cause we had our consultation pr uh, while I was pregnant. So the baby's out, I'm just like, you know, I, I knew what to do, but it, you know, it's, 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 he's his own little person, you know, um, I can't make him do things. Right. So, but even she still gave me some confidence and she's like, Oh, you're fine. She, I told her everything I'd learned. And she was like, you're, you're doing everything right. She's like, you know, it's going to take him a little bit. He's got to learn too. So, but she's like, you're fine. You're not going to have any big hurdles. And, and so far it's, it's been, it was good. Uh, you know, no latching problems. He gained quickly right at, Oh, I don't know. When he was about nine, nine months old, he's about 10 months now. I started to have issues, not with latching, clogged milk ducts. And I uh, never had one before. And I've had six now. So I have experience with that, <laughs> which is I definitely learned a lot. But uh, it was definitely really stressful. I've learned how to take care of them, remedy them on my own, and of course, how to prevent them. <laughs> clogged ducts are anybody who's had them is not fun. It can be just an, anywhere from just a mild a nuisance to very sore to extremely painful and really have an impact on your baby's ability to latch, ability to get the milk. It can lower your supply, particularly if they become chronic. So they're not something to fool around with. And it's just one of those things that until it happens to you, you just, if you read it in your book, you're like, oh yeah, I heard about clogged ducks and I hope I don't get one. When you actually get one, totally different story. It's rough, rough. <laughs> so we can talk about that more, but I do want to go back to the very early days because here's the thing is this is one of the reasons that I love doing this show is because once we get past that newborn stage and we're very confident, it's like we almost forget about those early struggles or our lack of confidence and just unsurety in what we're doing. And for so many moms, that is such a crucial time that they don't understand that there really is a huge learning curve. And if all they ever do is hear about us moms confident because we're doing it once, twice, three times, and we're like, oh yeah, I got through that and everything was fine and the baby did fine and great, great weight gain, great latch, great everything. And we're not talking about that hard part, which which certainly doesn't happen to every mom, but probably more moms than not go through a huge learning curve. Even when things are going well, there's still a huge learning curve. And so I like to really talk about that in, in depth so that mothers who are listening really know that when they go through that themselves, that A, they're not alone and B, that it's actually quite common because when moms just hear only that it was smooth and everything's fine, that's their expectation. And if that's not happening to them, they then think there's something wrong with them, something wrong with their baby. And so I just want moms to know that there's a learning curve. Tell us a little bit about like, say that the, just those first two weeks, anything that you found that was a surprise to you, how awkward or how difficult or you know, just I don't want to put adjectives into your mouth. I want you to explain to me a very early couple of weeks until things did get because for the most of us, if we stick with it, it does get easy. It gets second nature and it's incredibly convenient. But until we get to that point, there's for most of us, there's usually some bumps along the road. So I want you to talk about a little bit of your bumps. Well, I, I first off do want to say like with at a newborn child and even kids really at any age, just don't give up whatever it is, whether it's trying to get them to eat healthier or trying to get your newborn to latch properly. Don't give up. 
find a support group, see a lactation consultant. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep trying and it will get better. Um, but it's the perfect nutrition for that baby. Energetically, it's made for them. It's from you. So definitely don't give up. But see, as far as challenges, I mean, yeah, it, it's really just this uncertainty. You know, as soon as he came out, I'm just, you know, overwhelmed with this emotion and I'm crying because he was late and I was induced and right. I'm just like, oh, finally I have my baby. So right away I'm trying to latch him. I think he, he kind of did a little bit. It wasn't necessarily a perfect latch, but in those moments, I wasn't really too worried about it. I was just so, you know, so overwhelmed. I mean, he'd literally just come out of my body. I remember uh, the next day or later that day, trying to get him to latch and just, I would say it's more just uncertainty of, you know, I remember seeing all these videos, you know, that we went over during our consultation. Most of what I felt was just an uncertainty was this, is this the right way? I, I, I think I'm doing everything right, but who can tell me, how do I know? How do I, is this right? Is, you know, is this, is his mouth where it should be? It's like, I knew what I was supposed to do. I, I knew on paper, like, okay, his chin is supposed to be here. I'm supposed to, you know, grab him here. But is it, is he, is he comfortable? Am I comfortable? Is it, is it hurting? Is it, you know, it, it's just this uncertainty and this nervousness. I feel like no one could have settled it for me. I feel like if, if you had come, if you were there with me, you know, and you could have been like, yes, it's fine. That's what I needed really. <laughs> but what about over the course of the first few days or so, it's not uncommon for many of us to be nervous or anxious. It's this invisible container. And, you know, we are just like all of a sudden, like whoosh in charge of this little newborn's life and sustaining them. And many of us are very nervous because we cannot see the volume going in. So did you have any nervousness or anxiety about, you know, is my baby getting enough? I would say not as much. I would say I had nervousness and anxiety when my full milk came in because they said like there's like this pre-milk, right? So when my milk milk came in, he went to sleep very heavily and I couldn't wake him up with my nipple and I freaked out. I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, there's something wrong with him. I text my doctor. She's like, no, it's okay. Your milk has more fat in it. It fills him up more. But I freaked out because he'd never not responded to my breast before. I was always able to wake him up with like by putting my boob in his face, basically. And uh, that didn't happen this time. And I, I just, I freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, he never ate for a long period of time. I would say very early on. So there was a little bit of nervousness about that. Just the first few weeks, it was just, just trying to get him to latch properly. There was definitely, I would say, yeah, a little bit of latch issues. I had to just remember to correct him right away. Even my partner at the time was would like help out and kind of play with his chin and to get him to open up properly. So, um, yeah, we just kept trying. I would just say just keeping at it, but definitely seeing the lactation consultant see, really, really helped. I mean, it really made a huge difference. I can't imagine doing that blind. I could, I mean, I can totally understand why women would stop. I could totally get that if, if they didn't have the information that was given to me. How about sleep? How did you deal with the frequency of breastfeeding? You know, no matter how many times people say, oh, during your pregnancy, sleep now because you'll never get a chance to sleep after. And, and we're like, yeah, 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 I know, I know. But then it comes your time and then you're like, oh, this is what they must have been talking about because your, you know, your sleep is just all over the place. And and I think some of us, we prepare for that during pregnancy because we may not be sleeping as well near the end, but it's still nothing like the early days of breastfeeding. So how did you deal with that? I mean, you, you just do really, you know, there's different approaches too. I mean, you know, I was told by my doctor, you know, feed every two hours. I don't remember you or, or other lactation consultants saying that, like even in my birth class. So it's like, I was told different things. I decided let's do the every two hours. There, there's also, you know, an instinctiveness that I think that us as mothers in general should really learn how to just trust ourselves and, 
think back to like if it were cavemen times and you didn't have a doctor or a lactation consultant to tell you what to do, what would you do? Would would you wake your baby up every two hours or would you or would they wake you up? You know, they're going to wake you up when they're hungry. You know, so I, of course, I want to say, of course, always ask your doctor, you know, trust yourself, too. I was just so paranoid about anything going wrong. That's just the type of person I am that I was like, okay, every two hours. And there was a few times where, you know, I slept past and it was like four hours and I'm like, oh my God, he didn't eat, but he's fine. Like he, he wakes me up when he's hungry. He was fine. And I have other friends that they didn't do that. They, they, they didn't wake the baby every two hours. The baby will wake you when they're hungry. The, I mean, they'll wake you up for sure. You know? So, um, of course, like I said, you know, I want to, you know, preface that with, you know, check with your doctor, but you know, I was just tired. I, I definitely, I, I was just tired all the time. I was very lucky to have the support of my mother and my partner. And we were trying to do everything natural as far as really supporting the mother in postpartum and really letting me rest. So I, I tried to stay in the bed. Yeah. I really just, yeah. Slept when he slept, woke up. Yeah. I mean, really all the time. I mean, I didn't really deal with it besides just dealing with it. You know, I was just really tired. I wasn't too crabby. Uh, I encapsulated my placenta that seemed to help with my mood and emotion, but I don't really have an answer as far as like, how did I deal with it? I just, you know, you just kind of do, (laughs) you just kind of do it. How long do you feel it took you realistically speaking until you were able to trust your instincts, which I absolutely love and, you know, start to be with your baby and learn about your baby's cues and trust that they will wake up when they're hungry. How long did it take you to move Mm. away from that paranoid feeling of needing to feeling like you needed to wake them up every couple of hours? Probably, gosh, maybe a month, maybe a month or so. And at that point, were you were you starting to see the weight gain, starting to see the chub, starting to see the rolls and saying, you know what, I think we're good? Uh, I don't remember as far as when I noticed weight gain. I mean, I had the regular checkups and I there weren't any problems as far as the numbers with his weight gain. But I don't remember like when I visibly like noticed like, oh, you know, it's OK. It was it was more. I think it was more just, uh, yeah, trusting that he'll wake me up. I think just after a certain period of time passes, just realizing, you know, he's healthy. Everything's okay. I I can't put my finger on like a a moment. It it was just, it was, it was gradual. It was just very gradual and just like, you know, he's fine. You know what? He's okay. And I'm okay. And, you know, let's get some rest if we can get some rest. (laughs) That's cool. It's nice when it when it just comes from you and from within rather than other people telling you and then you following someone else's rules. And that still may not be what your baby is trying to tell you. So there's a, an inherent beauty that comes with being comfortable with accepting our baby's cues and just intuitively knowing that that is good enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me, did you spend time sleeping with your baby? Did you bed share or room share? Oh, I still do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I sleep with him every night. I mean, I I got a crib. (laughs) It's, It's there. I used to, I would put him in it when I had to do things. And then I remember I was in the kitchen one day and I looked back and I saw him standing in it and I was like, oh, dear God. And I ran, but he wasn't tall enough to climb (laughs) out of it at that point. So at that point, we ended up getting a playpen. But yeah, yeah, I uh, slept with him from very early on. My partner was nervous having him when he was really little, having him in the bed with us. And he's like, but he's just so little. And we kind of we kind of went back and forth with that. So there were a couple times that I put him in the crib. But for the most part, he was he slept with me and, and he still sleeps with me. It's great. I think that is probably one of my best tips for moms if they're open to it when they're talking about how can they get some much needed rest. A big part is to uh, is to keep your baby tucked in nice and close to you so you can be there for their cues as far as feeding and taking care of them and getting some rest on your own. Absolutely. I mean, it's definitely helped me for sure breastfeeding with that because if he wakes up in the middle of the night, I don't have to fully wake up and he doesn't really have to fully wake up. You know, he, I'm right there and he can just nurse. 
you know, for a little bit. And it's, it's usually, you know, not a huge beating. It's usually just like, oh, to, and then he'll go back to sleep. So I can't imagine having to get up and warm a bottle and all that. And like I said, there's, you know, there's nothing wrong if, if you, you have to do that or if, even if that's your choice, but it's definitely more convenient for sure. And definitely helps me get more rest being able to do that. Yeah. For many of us, it's incredibly convenient. So you've had this lovely breastfeeding journey. Tell me one thing that you really love about breastfeeding. Oh, the closeness, the intimacy. God, I don't know. Intimacy times 10. I need a thesaurus. I mean, it's just, it's just so amazing. When you thought about breastfeeding your baby, I imagine for you, it was uh, a big part of it was the nourishment that you would be providing for your baby. Is the intimacy and the closeness, is that like 10x compared to anything you ever thought that you would get from breastfeeding? I mean, I can't even, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm actually getting teary eyed right now. Just thinking about it. Just, it's just this love that you just can't describe, you know? I mean, oh, I just, you just <laughs> never thought, you know, I could love someone so much. And, and when he's nursing and like just looking up at me, it's just, it's amazing, you know, until they get teeth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we work with that too, but it's, it's actually pretty incredible because, you know, like you said, you're getting teary eyed. This is something that, oh, yeah. Another one of the things about motherhood and breastfeeding that you can't explain to someone. And when I teach breastfeeding classes and talk about it, I don't even actually try and, even go there with that because it's just too hard. And, and women, when, especially when they're pregnant for the first time, you just don't understand the core and the depth of the feelings that you have it at some point in your nursing relationship, when you're looking at your baby and you can't imagine doing anything else and you have no idea how you could ever love another human being. Oh and God. when we have another baby, we do, but <laughs> this is, you're just looking at this baby that was almost like this project when you were pregnant. Mm. And now you're just like almost one with the baby for a while. Oh yeah. It's amazing. I, I, you know, I had a lot of friends and, you know, everybody really is just like, you know, you have to this, you've got to do that. And, and I had lucky enough to have a couple of friends that were like, you know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. There is no right or wrong way, you know, because I, you know, <laughs> people laugh at me, but I actually, he still takes naps on me. I don't have a place to put him down. <laughs> he goes to sleep, actually. Um, I used to put him in the playpen sometimes, but I mean, really very rarely. But he start, he got tall enough to climb out, so we had to lower it. And now I can't really put him down without waking him up. So I let him, he naps right on me. And I, you know, sometimes I'll put him on the bed if I'm right there, but he'll climb off of it. So I can't really, I mean, most of the time he sleeps on me. He takes naps on me unless we're driving in the car, you know, and, and I'm, I'm okay with that. People are like, oh, you have to, you have to this. I'm like, I don't know. No, I don't. No, I don't. I work pretty much from home. I can get more done if he's asleep on me than if I put him down and there's a chance of him waking him up and. I'm okay with it, you know, and, and it's okay that you put your baby down. It's all okay, you know. It's so cool, Elizabeth, that you're just not one of these rule followers. You think you have <laughs> to do what other people tell you to do with your baby because some of us, I mean, I was definitely like that with some things with my first baby. Mm -hmm. It took me a little while to get to the place where you're at now. And then I just did this total switcheroo and then really had that mindset that you have. It's like, no, I don't have to do that. Right. I don't know why you're doing that. <laughs> Maybe that works for you, right. but I don't have to do that. Well, and evolutionarily, they're not even equipped to sleep without us until they're around three years old, as far as evolution goes, because that's when they can begin to feed themselves. So it's okay that you've trained your baby to sleep away from you, but evolutionarily and like mentally and physiologically, they're not even meant to do that yet. Like I said, you know, you this and that with your baby and you have to put them down. I'm like, no, I don't. There's, they were inside of me for nine months. like. I, w I made them. <laughs> I made a toe from scratch. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, I, I've created life inside of me. So there's, there's this bond that, you know, is unimaginable and indescribable. And, and, and I'm okay with that. I'm, if he's a mama's boy, I'm fine with that. Yeah. You know, people freak out about that too. But, uh, not only that I've raised a boy, I've, witnessed thousands of mothers raise boys that whatever that whole mama boy thing is it doesn't whatever it is whatever people think it is 
they will eventually go off to play with other children, perhaps to school, to grandma's house. And, you know, it is a natural evolution for them as, as they develop and it doesn't always stay the same. And you're pretty wise. And, and like you said, you also have that ability because you're working from home. So you're able to do that. But this time it really will go pretty fast and you will long for the days when he was happy to just sleep on your chest. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my uh, my mom was reminding my dad of that because he was he was kind of pushing, you know, to start working again. And my mom was like, you know, they're only this small once like you can't go back. So enjoy it. And she reminded him, she was like, you know, you know, no one watched me until I was like, I think she said like around two years old. She's like, I didn't have anyone watch you for a long time. You were with me. So yeah, so it's all good. Yeah, there's no redo or rewind button. Right. Taking a little break to let you know that you can now order my first ebook, which is all about the fourth trimester. I am really excited to bring to you the New Mother's Guide, Practical Tips for the Fourth Trimester. It is filled with lots of great tips on preparing and getting yourself organized for the first 12 weeks at home with a new baby. I have taken what many of us experienced mothers have already learned along the way and put it into a book that is easy to read and focused just on this subject. There's no need to wade through tons of other new parenting info just to get the goods on surviving those first 12 weeks. This is a great guide for anyone who feels there's more they can learn about getting all their ducks in a row before the new baby is here. It is a great gift for any new mother. It is the cheat sheet that I wish I had when I was pregnant the first time. Here is the site where you can go for more information, www.allaboutmothering.com slash fourth dash trimester dash ebook. One more time, www.allaboutmothering.com slash fourth, F-O-U-R-T-H dash trimester, T-R-I-M-E-S-T-E-R dash ebook. Let's get back to the show. Tell us if you had to share one thing with a mother that's listening to this show and hasn't had her baby yet, Mm. what is one thing you would love for her to know about breastfeeding? About breastfeeding specifically, hmm, just just don't give up and uh, don't get discouraged. And uh, if you need help, reach out for help. It's okay to need help and uh, help is out there. Don't give up, I, I would say, is, is the best thing that I could say. For, for me, when I say don't give up, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about my clogged ducks. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what I'm specifically thinking about. But I mean, as far as anything goes, re- reach out for help. There's so many women that have gone through whatever it is you're going through. There's so many women. You know, my I was lucky. I had a, The first time it happened, I had a girlfriend come in the middle of the night and say, okay, this is what we have to do. And we just had some hot water and we've just kept at it and finally got it and, you know, got, got some relief. Essential oils actually also really helped me too. But um, yeah, just, just don't give up and, and reach out for help. You know, if you want help, if you feel like, if you feel unsure, if you can find free help, that's great. And I, I know, you know, not everyone has necessarily a budget for that, but it's, I really, it's really, really worth the money. And I want to say like, I'm not getting paid to say this. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm, I mean, it's, it's worth it. Invest in your health. It will save your life. It will save you so much stress in the, in the long run. I mean, I, I really think every mom, I really, really believe this. I tell people this all the time. I think every new mom should see a lactation consultant. I really, really believe that. You know, it's wonderful for you to say that, you know, to, to really let moms know that it's okay to ask for help and to get help. I think I hear a lot of moms say that at this point in their breastfeeding life, months or years later, and I don't know how you were, but more moms than not may not reach out for help because it's this thing that we have in our head that it's a natural thing to do and it should come naturally. 
and I am this baby's mother and I should be able to figure out on my own. And I'm a, a, a huge proponent of, you know, different things in our life, trying to figure out on our own. I do the same thing myself. I've just learned that when it comes to, especially the early days of breastfeeding and lactation, that is not the time that you want to sit home in your own place, isolated for days or weeks, trying to figure out on your own. Yeah, that it really, it, it is a, a huge thing to be able to ask for help for some moms. And yet that's exactly what you need to do because things can go south pretty quickly and moms can, they either give up or they just cannot continue because things are going so poorly and you cannot afford to have days and days and days go by with poor feedings or painful feedings, if that's the case, or your baby not gaining. So I love when moms who have experience and have come through all that get to this point and that you can still look back and say to the new soon to be mother, the importance of really reaching out for help and how, how just important that is. And that it's, I always say it's a sign of strength to ask for help. Many of us think it's a sign of weakness to ask for help. So it definitely is a sign of strength. So I really like that you shared that Elizabeth. Thank you. I would love for you to share some information that you learned. I don't necessarily want to go back to pregnancy, but I actually do want to mention that on the allaboutmothering.com membership site, you've been extremely generous and have given us a video, which I have in the membership site talking about superfoods that you can eat um, either preconception or and or during your pregnancy and when you're breastfeeding. And I would like for you to share with us a little bit. Um, we can get to the work that you're currently doing, but I'd like for you to preface that by telling us some things that you have learned about nutrition and pregnancy and the early days of postpartum that were actually different than what you had learned in a book or thought. And then you have your real life experience of perhaps not having a pregnancy where you were craving all these really good foods. Maybe you crave foods that you had been staying away from for a while. Maybe the foods that typically sat well with you maybe weren't sitting so well with you during pregnancy. And I think that those are the things about taking the book learned and, and what other people tell you and then what you realize with your own body. So why don't you pick one or two things that surprised you that you realized that you had to make changes and you needed to adapt them to, to your own body? Oh, I, I mean, that, that was super easy. I know exactly what I was going to talk about when you started. I, I have two very specific experiences. I mean, I was as a nutritionist, I'm pretty healthy, you know, maybe too healthy to the point where I thought I was immune, right? Like I was like, I can eat whatever I want. So before I got pregnant, I was having, you know, salads and smoothies and juices every single day, every day. And when I got pregnant, I couldn't finish a smoothie to save my life. I just wanted bread and pasta, which I never ate to my partner at the time. We would go out to eat and he would get like an all organic, homemade from scratch, plant-based burger. And I would just like, oh, so much bread. Like I was totally judgy, right? And that's all I wanted was just sandwiches and pasta when I got pregnant. I read an article in Vegan Health and Fitness Magazine by Dr. Brooke Goldner. She's fantastic. And uh, her article was great about her pregnancy. And she just basically said, you know, have your best plan. And she said, and be prepared to abandon it. It just really helped me to forgive myself and to be like, yes, of course, try to eat as healthy as you can, but be forgiving with yourself and just know that your baby's going to get everything he needs because he's going to pull it from you. Okay. So if you're not eating the best foods, that's okay. You'll just feel crappy. <laughs> okay. But the baby's going to get everything that they need. They'll pull it from your body. Right. Which is one of the reasons it's so important to eat healthy. Given that, with my food cravings, I mean, I just did my best to put greens in, in, in everything, you know, put, hide them, put, make your sandwiches with as many healthy veggies as you can. So 
so satisfy whatever that craving is, right? But just try to find a healthier option. If it's ice cream, try to find an organic non-dairy ice cream. If it's a sandwich, try to find the best whole grain bread, no corn syrup. Try to put veggies in there. Use hummus as a spread instead of mayonnaise, things like that. Put greens in your pasta, arugula, olive oil, and red pepper flakes. And pasta was like one of my favorite meals. I ate that a ton. So that would be my first experience. And kind of piggybacking off of that, shortly afterwards, my partner and I split up about when my baby was about three months old. And I kind of stopped caring about what I was eating. I wasn't watching my protein anymore because I wasn't pregnant. And I was eating, yeah, more like sugary, just really quick stuff because I was by myself at this point. So like cereals and pasta still. I gave myself a blood sugar condition called hypoglycemia, which is basically low blood sugar. So what that means is if I eat something too sugary, my blood sugar would spike and then it drops. And this happens to everyone, right? It becomes hypoglycemia when it goes, when you start experiencing symptoms. So I actually, as a nutritionist, I actually worked with Dr. Gabriel Cousins at the Tree of Life, and they actually successfully reversed diabetes with a specific diet. And it happens to be a raw food diet. And I'm very educated on raw foods. And I knew that if I could go raw, this would take care of my blood sugar condition. But I was told by everyone and their mom, both my NDs, that I couldn't go raw, that if I detoxed, it would the toxins would go to my breast milk and into my baby. And so for months and months, I tried to manage it with a cooked food diet that was balanced for the most part, but it, it, it didn't, it didn't work. And I was, it was very stressful and really emotional. And I, I can't even tell you how many, how much stress I went through. I mean, it was really, really hard. I, I was debating weaning my child off of my breast so that I could kill myself. I, I didn't know what to do. I was desperate. And I did my own research and I found a few studies, um, not just anecdotal stories. I did also use those. I, I don't want to say uh, to just abandon those. I did use some anecdotal story, stories, but I also found specific studies that measured the levels of toxins in breast milk in a few situations. One of them was as a woman lost weight and they saw that the level of toxins in the milk didn't increase while they lost weight. One of them was they measured VOCs, which is volatile organic compounds, which is stuff that's in like exhaust. And they measured that in the breast milk compared to the air around them. And there was uh, way less toxins in the milk. And then another one measured meat eaters breast milk compared to vegetarians. The meat eaters breast milk had literally 98 to 99% more toxins in the milk than the vegetarian breast milk. Another study showed that if women took chlorella specifically, that it would actually decrease the level of toxins in their breast milk as they took it. So I took all of those along with some other anecdotal stories I saw of many women safely going raw during their pregnancy and while breastfeeding. And so at that time, I, I took matters into my own hands and once again, check with your doctor, right? But um, yeah, I, I, I didn't listen to my doctor, quite frankly. I, I, I was feeling terrible. It had been months. It had been months. And I was just like, I can't keep doing this. So I changed my diet. I went raw and my baby was totally fine. I didn't see any change in behavior. Weight gain was fine, didn't decrease. No extra fussiness, nothing like that. You know, watch for all those signs, right? everything was fine. And I'm way, way better. My blood, my blood sugar levels are completely level. Now I get hungry now, which for months I wasn't feeling hungry. I would just feel really sick when I needed to eat. Those would be my two experiences that were definitely different from what I was taught or uh, told. So I'm curious when you say that you were counseled to not go to a raw foods diet, these are my words, but leach, you know, all those excessive toxins into your milk, which would get to your baby. At that time, did you know of any research studies and or did you ask any of the physicians who told you to not do that? Did you ask anybody to show you the research that proved that would happen? No, you know what? That's a really good question. I actually didn't. And even prior to my pregnancy, for me, my common sense, it said that hey, if I go raw, it'll detox into the milk. But what I didn't realize, because pregnancy and 
wasn't my specialty before I got pregnant, right? I don't want to say it's my specialty now, but I've definitely learned a lot. You know, I focus on that now more because of my experiences. I realized and I've seen a lot of studies that show that our body, it's, it has all these amazing protection mechanisms for it. So they've even, there is a study that measured like the alcohol and the milk and please, I'm not encouraging you to drink. Okay. That's once again, that's a common sense thing. Please, I'm not encouraging that, but they measured it. And it's, it's, there is very little in the milk, right? There is some, but very little. Uh, there was another study that measured someone taking too much vitamin C specifically, and the proper amount of vitamin C only came through the milk. So depending on the item, like maybe alcohol, because it's maybe there was some synthetics in there, who knows why some of it got through. But in my experience, and from what the studies that I've seen, it looks like our body is protecting that baby as best as it can. I haven't studied every single item or every single herb, but that's what it looks like so far. In my experience, I, ha I haven't, I've only met a couple of doctors in the Valley that are familiar with and educated about raw food. And yes, of course, they went to medical school, but quite frankly, I knew more about the healing benefits of raw food than even some of the best naturopaths that I've met. One of these days, I'm going to have a pharmacist who specializes in breastfeeding and mother's milk so they could come on and talk about this in, in a way that I could never because it's certainly not my specialty. However, you're absolutely correct. In I, I often say that while there are certain things and particularly some prescription medication that you cannot take or need to take at a certain time frame so that uh, a volume doesn't get to your baby because it has a lot to do with the molecular weight and, and other chemistry. But the overall, in very simplistic terms, the breast the, is an organ and it actually is quite an amazing filter. It doesn't mean that toxins don't get into your milk. Toxins are in the air and chemical and there are some things that we just cannot avoid. But course, you know that you can reduce that amount. However, there is so much that can be taken care of the body that it always does amaze me that people who don't really know that and understand that, and they're just saying things that are basically just regurgitated information without the science behind them. And, you know, I really appreciate you, you telling us several things because it's like, one of those things, I'm sure you wear it as a, a badge and a source of pride to be a holistic nutritionist. And maybe it is a little hard for you to be transparent and say, but you know what? I went way by the wayside when I was pregnant. Then I had a personal, you know, a family issue that really sent me in another path. And then I was even worse than I was before. And, you know, I appreciate that you're a couple of things that you're not afraid to admit that because some people, especially when we're talking about nutritionists, everybody thinks that you're so perfect and all the time and extremely judgmental all the time. And I think that you may have been judgy with your partner about certain things, but I know you, you still already know that people come to this uh, the nutritional aspect of their life with different knowledge base, different baggage, different you know, what, what they grew up with, right? Two things. You got to meet people where they're at. I I've been there. I've been there and not that long ago, dude. I mean, I'm, I'm 32 years old. And when I was 25, I was doing drugs, drinking vodka and eating Jack in a box. Okay. So it, it, I've changed my life. I mean, so you got to meet people where they're at. And when I first started out, I was super judgy to everybody. And when I talk about it, I was judgy with him with bread. I mean, that was like long before I was pregnant. And I've, I've just learned partly because I've grown up a little bit and I'm matured, but also just through experience that that doesn't work. It's not going to get you anywhere with the people you want to reach. I'm not going to push my views or or even facts, the stuff that I know, I'm not going to push it on anybody. If you want to talk about it and you have questions, great, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to push it on you because if you're not ready for it, it's not going to penetrate. You know, you, you can't talk to the deaf man. He's not going to hear you. It's just not going to happen. So, so you got to meet people where they're at and be forgiving. And I want people to know, heck no, I'm not perfect. And I don't believe that there's a perfect. I believe that there's a best that you can do. 
All you can do is keep learning. And I'm, I'm continuing my education all the time. You know, I just attended another webinar last week. So as you learn more, you just make small, better choices, you know, oh, I'm done with that oil. Let's replace it with a better oil or whatever that is. You know, it's, it's taken me years to get to where I'm at and I'm at, I'm not at any perfect place. You know, this is, this is a new journey now. Now I'm with, you know, a child building a business and, you know, so it's, it's all a journey and there's no perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm glad that you're saying that not perfect and I'm certainly not looking for perfection, but I think I'm also really enjoy speaking with you, working with you and referring to you because I know that that is your overall general philosophy, which is to meet people where they're at and you start coming down too hard. They're not going, forget about penetrating. They're just going to turn off and not even listen. And it's not that you want to tell us you had, you know, like you enjoy telling us about your hardships, but it just really makes you be more real and makes people more open to working with you, knowing that you've had your own struggles and knowing that you can learn and grow from them and, and that we're constantly evolving. And that's actually why when I, when I met you and you were pregnant and I knew the work that you did, I was actually very excited in my own head. I never said it out loud, but I was very excited to be able to, you know, communicate with you about the changes that occurred during oh, your pregnancy and you know, that would happen. <laughs> uh, you know, but that would happen. I knew that you would go through those things, but oh, I'm anxious to see if you would pay attention to them and yeah. work along with them or if yeah. you would, you know, fight the system or <laughs> if you would pretend to the rest of the world that you were something that you're not. And I'm thrilled to see that. Because I do work with moms that I do know can hugely benefit from working with someone like you. And I just really wa I wanted you to be like that person that I could refer moms to because we all need that help, but we need it from the right person. Love yourself, man. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I was I was embarrassed that, that I'd given myself hypoglycemia. I'm this nutritionist. I mean, I didn't tell people right away for sure. It was I was embarrassed and ashamed. I, I couldn't believe how could I do this? And I think I put pressure on myself, but I feel this pressure from the outside world because people do put me on a pedestal. You know, I have a not a big, but a small following in the Valley. And people do like, I, even my close friends are like, well, I'm not as good as you. And I'm like, stop saying that They're, you're amazing. You're, you're, if you're making any change to better yourself in any way, whether it's whatever, any, any change to better yourself in any way, then you're amazing. That's all I want to say. I mean, you're amazing. If you're trying to grow, that's it. You're we're especially it's mothers. Dude, the stuff that our body has gone through, I mean, I, it's, their baby came out of you. <laughs> so that's what I mean. Like, that's something that <laughs> Elizabeth could just not have known or really understood to her oh, core yeah. until you were pregnant and had oh. a baby. And like, I, I couldn't tell you that. You, <laughs> right. you have to experience it yourself. Totally. Oh, my God. I would love for you to share with us what what is it that you're doing now in your career, in your work life? What are you passionate about and what are you doing with your work days at home with your babe? My work days are they're up and down. Uh, I still do colon hydrotherapy downtown Phoenix at Natural Medicine and Detox Center. I, it's not like regular. I pretty much like just see my clients and I do nutrition work and and supplements and I use essential oils with all my clients as well, too. So basically, I have a sugar detox that um, that's kind of become kind of my new passion, even though I was very educated on it before because of my own troubles with blood sugar. I've kind of that's a new path now that I've gone down is uh, really educating myself on sugar and and how it affects the body and it releases dopamine. And it, I mean, it is it's really addictive. We're all addicted to it. So I have a sugar cleanse that I'm starting right now. I did have the cutoff date for yesterday, but uh, I only had a few people sign up. So if anyone else wants to join and they're in the Valley, we can do it two ways. Basically, if they're in the Valley, I prepare all the food for you and uh, I am able to deliver it if you're within a certain miles or we can pick a uh, meat spot or I can um, give you recipes 
and then you can have that on your own. And then I'm going to do that same sugar detox again, and it's an all raw cleanse. And this diet has been proven by Dr. Gabriel Cousins to balance blood sugar levels and even reverse terminal chronic illness and lifestyle diseases, even when they say that there's quote unquote no cure. Um, now, if you do have one of those, you would have to stay on it for more than five days, right? It's been used in thousands of cases. Uh, it's called spontaneous remission. You can look that up. But um, yeah, so I'm going to be doing that again, July 24th. And then uh, the next month I am going to be launching a blood sugar management full on full month program. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, do, I still do free classes every second Saturday of the month uh, downtown. I'm going to start doing those, I think, at other places as well. First thing I wanted to say is I am a real psych because I am doing the sugar detox with you. So if anybody wants to get some feedback from me about my experience, you can always email me. You know, there's that contact me on allaboutbreastfeeding.biz and anybody could ask me about it. I'm also excited about it. So I've been telling people about it on this show. And um, like I said, happy to be able to share some feedback with anybody who's interested. So can't wait to start that. Also, do you still do cooking for people like come into their homes and help show them how to shop for foods, kind of like do a redo in their kitchen? I'm terrible at plugging myself. I am. Thank you so much. I have. I have quite a few services and I'm just, I'm like, oh yeah, I help people with nutrition. So yes, I am a personal chef. Uh, I do house calls. I do meal planning as well. So uh, I also do phone coaching and I even have a month a month package of phone coaching, which includes two weeks of meal plan. I do a personal wellness plan as well, which is included in my four week program and the sugar detox which is basically, it's like a treatment plan, but because I'm not a doctor, I can't call it that. But it's basically, I, I sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. I get all the details. I mean, down from how your bowel movements are, your skin, your sleep, your stress. And I get the nitty gritty details about what's going on, what you're eating. And I say, okay, look, you know, this is what's going on. This is what I think will help you. Uh, these are the herbs I want you to get on. I think you need, you know, colonics or whatever it is and change this diet. And uh, I do a grocery store field trip as well, uh, which is more affordable. And I also do classes in your home. And so if you get a group together, you can each ship in, you know, $10, $100 a minimum and really have a pretty affordable class in your home. And then I do the same thing for the grocery store field trip. And so for the grocery store field trips, I really like doing those because what I do is I want to, I want to shop where you shop. We're not going to Whole Foods or Sprouts because Yes, let's be honest. Most of us don't shop at Whole Foods. They are so expensive, right? So I want to shop where you shop. I want to go to Safeway or Fry's or I want to go to those local grocery stores and you come with your grocery list and let's pick out better alternatives for what you would already buy. That way it's familiar to you. And of course, you know, we'll do label reading and all of that stuff. So that that is one of my favorite services. And the home audits are great too, because it's similar, you know, we'll go through your cabinets. I'll look at all your supplements. We can look at the additives in there, what supplements are good, what are not, you know, set your oils. And we can even talk about, I have a new checklist actually I've just added, which is basically just detoxifying your home for people that want to take it to the next level. So that goes as far as like EMFs and having electronics in your bedroom. Uh, what kind of air filtration do you have in your home? Um, what kind of water system are you drinking or your toothpaste, your hair care, your skincare products. So all of those things I'm educated on and I can look at as well for those that want to take that home audit to the next level. So that's great because there are a lot of people who are looking to make those change. Sometimes they take way too long to start or don't start at all. We spend more time just thinking about it just because we don't even know where to start. But I want to, I want to circle back a little bit to the pregnancy and breastfeeding for just a moment as we close. What I want mothers to know is that they should not be afraid to make gentle, gradual changes, preconception, during their pregnancy, and after the baby's born. I work with many moms who are looking to make changes when they're breastfeeding, but some, some for losing weight, some for health benefits, some they've just, like um, you shared, kind of went a little wacky during pregnancy with the sugar and other cravings, and then they just kind of Keep those bad habits because the sleep cycle is way off and they're too tired to get back to where they were. 
And some also are just afraid. They're afraid to start on a, a reasonable dietary plan, a reasonable exercise plan, because the world just frightens people about making these changes during lactation. And yeah, and it stops and it delays women from reaching the, 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 their potential that they had hoped to because they're waiting until they stop breastfeeding. And that's my big take home point for this moment. I want people to know you don't need to stop to wait to breastfeeding to make nutritional changes. So everybody, I mean, you've heard Elizabeth talk here. You see how knowledgeable and yet easygoing and workable she is. So I, I encourage anybody who has any questions about their nutritional health to contact you. And I know they can go to, uh, is a good place to go to be more raw.com for them to get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. You can contact me through there. Absolutely. Yeah. Just click on contact and you can see my services there. A lot of people would even really benefit from just a simple phone consult because it'll give them the tips and the tools of, yeah, just how and where to start, you know, how to make small changes. I mean, I have specific tools that, that I implement with people, you know, like make a, make a list of your goals and pick one. Don't overwhelm yourself because it can, it's, it can be overwhelming. I mean, there's so much information out there, you know, but just start small. Well, that's the thing is it could be so overwhelming that I know with myself with certain things in life, it stops me from even beginning right. just because totally. it's so overwhelming. Right. Like you said, if you just make a list of your questions, like you can get someone started. And sometimes once someone gets through all that stuff and then they get started, continuing on that path is much easier because they were able to get started. Absolutely. Especially if it's baby steps. That's my motto. I wish I made it up, but baby steps, progress, not perfection. That's the goal. And take chlorella. And now you and can really say baby steps. Yes, I can. <laughs> Cause he is baby stepping and I take chlorella every I day. Know. Take, take a bunch of chlorella <laughs> every day. All right, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, I really <laughs> want to thank you so much. I know it's a Saturday. You have family members watching your cutie pie while you're doing this podcast. So I know that uh, it's it's really it was an important thing for you to do. And yet mommy and baby. So I don't want to take away too oh, much thank time you. from that. But I really, really do appreciate you being on the show. And again, people can ask me feedback about the cleanse. And in addition, if people go to allaboutmothering.com, the membership site. It's still brand new. There's still a lot of stuff I need to add to it. But if you want to kind of get in on the ground floor and see what I'm up to, you could check that out and you'll be able to see Elizabeth. She has a, a great 30-minute uh, video in there that talks that gives you a lot of good information about nutrition during pregnancy and postpartum. So I really appreciate you doing that for us too, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this was great. I can't believe I got teary eyed twice. <laughs> well, you know, when we're talking about our babies, it's just, just oh, happens organically. Stop. Right? stop. All right. You have a wonderful day. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It is important to say here that I am not a physician and Elizabeth reminded us that she is not a physician either. She provides an intake that takes about 60 to 90 minutes with her clients before she even begins to offer suggestions. I believe when it comes to nutrition and exercise during the time period that you're lactating, that common sense should always prevail. Unless you have a medical condition that prevents you from doing so, you would want to start any exercise program gradually and you would not want to do anything to an excess, like start training for a triathlon while breastfeeding without having a discussion with your physician. The same thing goes for nutritional changes during lactation. You wouldn't want to start a major detox during this period, particularly without speaking with someone who has knowledge in this area. While Elizabeth has done her own research and trained with an expert and felt comfortable switching to a raw foods diet, and while based on the readings that I have done, it certainly sounds reasonable, I would suggest that if this sounds reasonable to you, that you do this in partnership with Elizabeth or another nutritionist who is familiar with this type of dietary changes. Again, I would like to thank Elizabeth for sharing her story. I hope you found it interesting, inspiring, 
and educational. And I encourage you that if you like this show, please share it with another mom you know who would find it interesting. My new mantra is, if you like the All About Breastfeeding show, encourage another mom to subscribe to this show too. Don't let All About Breastfeeding be the next best kept secret. That's my mantra. This show continues to grow and spread globally. Thanks so much to all of you. Those who know me, though, know that I often say I'm greedy, but in a good way. I am an IBCLC on a mission to have breastfeeding become a part of everyone's normal, everyday life. We will do that by having people understanding the breastfeeding mother and baby much better. This show has gone from being heard in less than 10 countries the first month it was out to 30 countries within a few months to over 50 countries the first year, and now, a year and a half later, it is heard daily in 93 countries. Since there are currently 196 countries to go, well, that's what Google tells me, that means that we have 103 countries to go. Yep, I'm greedy. We have our work cut out for us. With your help, though, this will happen. Not everyone I know is hip to podcasting, so you may have to walk them through subscribing to the show. And when someone subscribes to the show, it makes it real easy because it's automatically downloaded so you don't have to do anything else when a show is released that day. When you open up iTunes, it is there for you to listen. On that note, I'm going to sign off for today. Until the next show, bye-bye.